Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from TRT World Studios in Istanbul. Today, we'll pay a visit to the cats, keeping watch over a St. Petersburg gallery since the time of the Tsars. We're also celebrating 275 years since Sotheby's first brought down the hammer. And later, we'll take a trip through the looking glass by taking a peek into the surrealist wonderland of artist Jim McKenzie. But first... A migrant painter of modern times, we look at the 20th century Turkish artist who blazed a trail for women. One picture's worth a thousand words, I suppose. It's, it's communication. I mean, we probably look at pictures more now than we've ever looked on our iPhones. Showcase talks portraits, pioneers and the 1960s in an exclusive interview with one of Britain's most famous photographers, David Bailey. David Bailey has taken pictures of everyone, from Queen Elizabeth to supermodel Kate Moss, with a career that spans almost 60 years. He's seen it all and photographed almost as much. In that time, he was part of an epoch-defining time at Vogue magazine, married and divorced French actress Catherine Deneuve, and produced more than 45 books. Needless to say, he has no plans of slowing down, something which showcases Miranda Atty found out when they spoke during Bailey's latest exhibition at London's Gagosian Gallery. You photograph some of the most famous people in the world, but you always seem to show a different side of them. How do you get them to open up in front of your lens? I don't know, really. It just happens. I, mean, I talk to them before I take their picture I do, or do anything. I, I sort of talk to somebody for at least an hour, I, as long as I can. And then the picture takes roughly 10, 15 minutes. What is it about your work, do you think, that really came to embody London in the 60s? Well, I hope it's not particularly the 60s, but the, uh, uh, I guess it was the most changed. It was when visuals changed the most in the early 60s, and it carried on ever since, really. You've spoken before about London in the 60s being a real time of possibility, opening up doors to working class people like yourself or actors like Michael Caine. Well, it's the first time the working class had a voice because they didn't really. If you were born in East Ham, you stayed in East Ham. And you never worked for Vogue if you had an accent like me, but somehow it all changed in the 60s. I think there was too many working class, they couldn't keep them down. Your shot of Jean Shrimpton was really defining in terms of creating the idea of a supermodel. What was it about her that was so breathtaking? Well, I suppose Jean was the first. We, we lived together for about three years, I think. Uh, she was my first love in a funny sort of way, so it was perfect for me and her. But she'd have made it anyway, I and mean, I'd have probably made it anyway if we hadn't met each other. We'd just been different way of doing it. This is quite a lean, pared down exhibition and all the more powerful for it. How did you decide which photographs to include? Uh, mm, it's a difficult one there. Uh, yeah. I don't know, it's sort of... I suppose we could do it again completely different, but it, these, these all work so... I'm quite happy, I'm really happy. I mean, it's the smallest exhibition I've had, which I think is great because it's sort of, it's small, but it says it all, really. I mean, some of the sixes were a bit silly, so at least this is not silly. 
Mick, no, I think Mick, I think that's my coat. I said, put my coat on. That's all I really remember, really. Uh, I done Mick. I used to do Mick often. I've done. I did him long before that as well. A uh, different picture when he was much younger, when he was about 18, I think. So uh, Mick was a mate, so it was easy. And Gene was a mate. And, and Jane was a mate. And Andy was a mate. Uh, they're all, they were all mates, so it's, it makes it easier if they're friends. This is quite a difficult question, but what do you think it is about photography that's able to capture something that words cannot? Well, it's that old uh, silly saying that uh, uh, one picture's worth a thousand words, I suppose. It's, it's communication. I mean, we probably look at pictures more now than we've ever looked on our iPhones. Or you do, I don't look at my own so much, but people seem to spend their whole life looking at pictures on their iPhone. Not pictures, but information. And a photograph is information. I suppose it's instant, you don't have to read a page, you can look at a picture and it gives you the information you're looking for, whether you like it or not. And speaking of smartphones, how do you think photography has changed since everybody got a camera on their smartphone? Yeah, it's changed now because people don't look at the photographs much anymore. They don't look at iPhone pictures. They take them, but they don't look at them. So I think it's important to have hard copies sometimes because in the future, no, no, there's going to be no, no images of now because people do it on their iPhone and it just goes off into the high clouds, whatever, and it, it's going to disappear. Whereas once you had a hard copy, sometimes I look at old photographic albums and they're much more interesting because they're hard copies. If they're on the internet, you just you take it for granted and you don't appreciate it. But uh, I don't think the, the, the camera on iPhones has got anything to do with, it's different kind of photography. It should be called digital photography, it should be called photography because I still use film photography and all the serious photographers that, that I know use film still. It's quite expensive, but it's the best. <laughs> David Bailey, thank you so much for joining us here on Showcase. She's a prominent figure who led social change through Turkey and beyond. But having spent much of her life living abroad, portrait painter Miri is largely unknown in her homeland. But here in Istanbul, Salt Galata has just kicked off its new exhibition, paying tribute to her work. Showcase's Adel Halim went to take a look at Miri's personal and artistic journeys. Studying Miri has been a passion for art historian Oslem Gulen Daolu. What began for Daolu as a PhD dissertation at the University of Montreal influenced this groundbreaking art exhibition in Istanbul. But as passionate as she is about this Turkish painter, she believes Miri has largely been forgotten in her birth country. Well, I would like people to know her to start with, her life, because it's, the, it's very interesting, and her art which is most interesting. She painted portraits of uh, the most influential uh, persons of the era. She is, I mean, even the controversial ones. She painted Mussolini, she painted Woodrow Wilson, she painted Franklin Delano Roosevelt, she painted Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, she painted Edwin uh, Markham, she painted Thomas Edison. I mean, she, George Bernard Shaw, she was really painting the most influential people. Born in 1885 in Istanbul, Miri continued her art education in Rome and Paris. And there's quite the story about that Edison portrait of hers. Well, of course, it was uh, the economic crisis in 29. The world succumbed to a huge economic crisis and she couldn't sell the portrait. So she thought she could, wrote, she could write um, Edison's brother-in-law <laughs> to say, well, Edison, set for me and I painted this portrait live. Uh, Edison's brother-in-law wrote to Rollins College President Hamilton Holt and asked, well, this lady is telling me that Edison set for her. Well, of course it wasn't because I found the photograph from which uh, Mihire painted the portrait. So she always knew how to um, coat <laughs> reality at some, in some way. A staunch defender of a woman's right to receive official art training, 
Miri became the first female director of Istanbul's Academy of Fine Arts in 1914. She later moved to New York and became active with the League of Women Voters, while also being regularly exhibited as a painter and educator. She was an avant-garde woman, so she always fought for all her life for uh, women's rights. Well, it's the first time women, Ottoman women, were receiving uh, an official art education in a university level. Miri's legacy is rooted in social change in several countries, but is barely referenced and only just now getting recognized in the place where her pioneering journey all started. Adil Halim, TRT World, Istanbul. Still to come on Showcase, celebrating 275 years of bringing down the hammer. At 139 million dollars. So Going, going, gone. One of the biggest auction houses in the world celebrates a major milestone. A room of their own. We take a peek into the lives of the cats who have taken up residence at Russia's Hermitage Museum. And it's all in the eyes. We'll introduce you to the artist who makes these fantastical sculptures that make you feel like you've just tumbled down the rabbit hole. From the scream selling for $120 million to a self-destructing Banksy painting, when it comes to making headlines and breaking records, it can easily be said that Sotheby's is one of the major players in the auction game, and it's been at it for a very long time. We're all done at £275,000. Leonard Kutzer. It was 1744 when young bookseller Samuel Baker brought down the hammer on his very first auction. After that, it didn't take him long to transform his business, selling rare books into a professional auction house. But it took until World War II for Sotheby's to gain its now famous reputation for making high profile sales, like Rubin's Adoration of the Magi. In 1955, it became the world's first international auction house and today has 80 offices in 40 countries. And while Sotheby's continues to be a go-between for collectors and works of art, it begs the question, in this digital age, are auction houses still relevant? To answer that question and others, art market specialist Bernadine Brockawida joins us from London. Hi Bernadine, thank you very much for joining us. So as we just heard, Samuel Baker was the founder of Sotheby's. Where did the name Sotheby's come from? It actually came from his nephew, John Sotheby, who set up the company um, that is today known as Sotheby's. So the company that set up, was set up in 1744 had a different name and then changed to be Sotheby's once John Sotheby took over. And why do you think auction houses are necessary? Why do we need a middleman? Why do we need an intermediary between buyers and sellers? Well, the thing that auction houses invest in more than anything else is um, the specialists that are within their uh, organization who know what they're selling and make sure that the buyers can be confident as much as possible that they are um, looking at the right type of object. So I guess that in short, um, the middleman is important to maintain the trust in the assets you're buying. So surely you could get that middleman online, like in this digital age, there's a lot of online bidding and online shopping. Can you see auction houses becoming an entirely digital thing? Well, they're already transitioning to a more and more uh, digital uh, environment. Many of the auctions are online only, so they don't even happen in the room. Uh, but I think that there still is a place when it comes to the high end of the market for the theater of the auction, where you actually buy the object in a room where you can hold your paddle and buy the piece. It just feels much more significant to buy a work for $100 million in that type of environment compared to online. So if you could expand on that a little bit, what is the appeal of actually going to an auction house? Why are people drawn to it? 
I, um, I do think that there is something about um, the experience of buying within an auction that really gets your blood pumping. It's something that's very exciting. And of course, there's a little bit of a show as well. You, the other people in the room see that you win the lot at the end of the day. So even though that can be emulated online and there is more and more technology that is working to build that type of an experience, uh, even some people feel that same experience when they're buying something on eBay. The uh, thrill of being at one of the evening sales at one of the major auction houses and buy, uh, winning that, that ultimate lot is really incomparable. Do you think that has anything to do with the scandal that happened in, uh, in around that time a couple of years ago to do with that, that fake being sold unknowingly by Sotheby's? It's, it's a sign of the times. The technology is getting better to sell our online, but the technology is also getting better to create fakes and forgeries, and the auction houses have to stay at the forefront of how to identify these fakes and make sure that they are... Um, that they are selling the real thing, which again leads to more costs. So what kind of technology, what kind of technology are auction houses uh, embracing to try and deal with this issue of forgeries? Yeah, I think that um, the main technology that's kind of the, the, the buzzword in the art world this year is artificial intelligence. Um, so that's looking at how you can use the data that you have from the past auctions, from your client behavior, from your past sales, and see if you can predict and forecast what's going to be happening going forward. Um, the issue that the uh, auction houses have with leveraging their uh, artificial intelligence and ma machine learning abilities is that the data that they have historically is siloed and it's inconsistent. So a lot of the work that's being done right now is actually in standardizing the way that they look at their data, making sure that it's usable by a machine to then be able to have the machine learning. Something that made the headlines when Sotheby made, Sotheby's made the headlines recently was Banksy's self-shredding balloon, girl with balloon. And do you think Sotheby's knew about that? How did he get it past security? I think that it's a very difficult subject to comment on, particularly if you think about it from an insurance and risk point of view, because if Sotheby's knew about it and they decided to sell it anyway, they were misleading the public. If Sotheby's didn't know about it and it got through security, then you also have an issue because they aren't doing their due diligence on their objects. So I think that either way, you're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't. Do you not there think are, that of course, that was good a lot publicity of rumors for them? A hundred percent, and it was good publicity for uh, Banksy, who is a mastermind of marketing. And it also is a comment on the auction process itself, because these street artists are creating works that they want to be seen by the public, and instead they're being sold for millions at auction, which goes against their whole belief system. So this is really a comment on that entire process. Bernadine, thank you very much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for having me. Once the Winter Palace, home to one of the world's most powerful families, the Romanovs. The State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg is now the second largest art museum in the world. But that isn't the only thing that makes it unique. What sets it apart from other major museums is the fact that it houses a great selection of movable art in its basements. <laughs> With halls decked with endless collections of decorative art, ancient Egyptian antiquities, not to mention a stunning range of Russian and European masterpieces, it's not a place you would expect a colony of cats to be lurking inside of. But they do, all 50 of them. They've been here for a long time, silently tiptoeing underneath the museum, eating, playing, but mostly sleeping in the basements of the former Winter Palace. But this didn't happen by accident. It all started in the 18th century, when the founder of St. Petersburg, Peter the Great, brought a Dutch cat into the Winter Palace. 
it was his daughter, Empress Elizabeth, who ordered the best and the biggest cats from the city of Kazan to control the mice taking over the palace halls. Later on, Tsarina Catherine the Great officially named the cats the Guardians of the Galleries. And since then, except for a three-year siege of the city, they've called the Winter Palace home. Flash forward to today. Their mice-catching duties are over, and they're no longer allowed inside the Hermitage Galleries. But thanks to the volunteers like Yulia Ales, they now inhabit the palace courtyard and the basement of the Hermitage. We are the museum caretakers. We work here in the basement because we help here and we love it. It's not a job, it's volunteering. The cat's food, medicines, beds and toys are all bought with the donations, which go directly into the cat's own bank account. Together with the museum's wet, the volunteers feed, treat and, more importantly, love each and every cat. Our cats fit their status. I can say they all have an impressive demeanor. They whisper the stories of the hermitage in your ear. And they are treated like royals by the volunteers as well as visitors who are lucky enough to get a glimpse of them strolling in the garden. A few years ago, the hermitage cats were featured in paintings by Aldar Zakiro, bedecked in imperial costumes and accessories, a depiction fitting the cat's regal status. Look who is sitting on the pipes. They're near us, but try to touch them and they run away. It's as if they're saying, you feed and take care of us, great, but keep a distance. And we will keep a distance too. Just fulfill your mission and everyone will be happy. Along with their own private bank account, the cats also have their own press secretary. And it's thanks to her efforts that the cats rule the museum's basements today. Just to prevent a museum uh, against mice and rats, because they live in the basement, and their smell, which we, we human can't feel it, but rats can. And that's why they prefer not to come. While they might have said goodbye to their mice-catching days, the cats still serve as living artworks of the Hermitage Museum, with both the museum's collection and the colony of cats giving visitors a piece of St. Petersburg's rich and storied history. With pieces titled Beach School and The Monster's Mother, it's no surprise that artist Jim McKenzie's work isn't for the faint-hearted. Some people find it beautiful, others say it's the stuff of nightmares. But with hundreds of thousands of followers on social media, it's clear his work is getting a lot of attention, for all kinds of reasons.
And that's it on this episode of Showcase. Don't forget, you can head over to our YouTube channel for more of our coverage of the global arts scene. I'm Murray Beveridge. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.